Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Monday, March 11th, 2024. Larry Johnson joins us now. Larry, it's a pleasure to see you. I had a, a very fine time in the Vatican. I had nothing to do with the Pope's comments, contrary to McGovern, but the Pope's comments on Ukraine, uh, but was happy to hear part of them. I wish he hadn't said this thing about white flag, but of course, I'm happy he mentioned negotiating. I don't know if the Pope's comments will mean anything to the people in uh, in Ukraine. They're fanatics that can't see what's happening to them. Yeah, they've already, they've already pushed, <clears throat> at least Zelensky and others have already objected to the Pope's comments as uh, interference. So Yeah. While I was away, or I think shortly before I left, uh, Victoria Newland announced that she's no longer uh, number three, I think, in the uh, State Department. Do you think... She jumped or she was pushed? Uh, I, I think she jumped. I know there's, uh, there's a good argument to be made that uh, she is pushed. I know that Ray uh, goes with the push, you know, hit the ejection button. Uh, well, you know, let, let's start with a lot of the confusion surrounding Newland. So she was acting deputy uh, secretary of state. That's the number two position. Uh, but her real job was undersecretary for uh, political affairs. That is, you know, a lot of people said, oh, that's the third most important job at state. No, it's not. It's the second. The, the reason is because that person, the, they go by the initials, P. Uh, there's M for management, S, secretary, P, political affairs. They sit atop all of the, uh, of the embassies, basically. All of the communications from the field flow through the through political affairs before they get to the secretary. So for any career foreign service officer, which Victoria Newland was one, getting that job is the pinnacle of your career, except for being named ambassador. Uh, the only better job would be secretary of state. And I think she realized she was never going to get that. The reason I think she jumped is she can read the tea leaves. She recognizes that this is a car going off a cliff with respect to Ukraine policy. And uh, she understands that if she's still in that position, she becomes a scapegoat. She got out before they can scapegoat her. Uh, she's not going to be the one. Like As an example, when her replacement was announced, what was the one thing people said? Oh, that's the guy who was in charge when Afghanistan fell apart. They don't talk about the person who was actually before him. You don't hear the name of the ambassador to Afghanistan. So uh, I, I think what we're looking at here is uh, she recognizes what a disaster is starting to unfold, and right. she got out while she could. Do, do the neocons ever acknowledge that they were wrong on a war they started? <laughs> ever. <laughs> wrong? You know, I forget which uh, movie character it was. It couldn't even form the word wrong. You know, rah, 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 you know, they right. had trouble even saying the word. No, heavens no. There's no sense of shame. They admit they admit no failure. They admit no wrong. Uh, that, uh, you know, going into Iraq was not a disaster. Oh, heavens no. It was, uh, you know, a great accomplishment. So I, I think she's getting out. So she's not done. Uh, you know, I think she's, she, she's going to be back. Uh, in, in some form or fashion, if she can, but uh, she's also not dumb. She, you know, she's not without intelligence. She can read tea leaves, and once she sees that the the Republicans basically are s stepping away, uh, they're going to be in a position to blame this on the Republicans. That's what that's what I think you're going to see her doing. Uh, she'll become part of some uh, Democrat campaign effort. Uh, to pin all of the failure in Ukraine on Republicans. All right, give me give me two scenarios here, Larry, uh, with respect to Ukraine. One, uh, Mike Johnson caves, <clears throat> uh, allows a vote on the floor of the House. Mm -hmm. uh, enough Republicans and Democrats vote in favor of the sixty one billion, and and Biden signs it into law. We know it goes in in tranches, and we know some of it is strategically timed to force the hand of whoever will be inaugurated president in January 25. But that's one scenario. The other scenario is that Mike Johnson does not cave. Uh, Europe panics, but they don't send anything uh, meaningful. Take it from there. 
So if, uh, if if Johnson caves, it's going to be good news for Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, uh, U.S. defense contractors. Uh, as far as Ukraine, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they, they, they can give them $200 billion. Let's give them $400 billion. It's not going to change the situation on the ground. And the situation is this. They can't find 700,000 soldiers, okay? They're missing. <laughs> Where'd they go? They're, they, they were here a minute ago. Uh, they don't have trained soldiers. Uh, they don't have an air defense system. That's being picked apart. So uh, there, there's nothing they can do militarily now to change this. This is, this is like what happened to, if, if you will, the Germans after the Battle of Kursk in World War II. And then, then the Operation Bagration. They were on their hills. They were headed back. Yeah, they they could still kill some Russians. They could still uh, throw some bombs at civilians, but it wasn't going to change the outcome. That's where we're at. So uh, whatever uh, Johnson does at this point, it's going to be done entirely for political calculation. I personally believe that he will uh, finally uh, approve some of the money, uh, if, if for no other reason, so that those defense contractors can kick some money back to the Republicans. Terrible uh, state of affairs. Has uh, the Russian military succeeded in destroying U.S. HIMARS and Patriot missile systems on on the ground in Ukraine? It's, yes, they've done it previously, but it has accelerated over the last two weeks. And, How so? Uh, uh, you've got uh, th uh, three, I believe. There, or, th there's one video out there I've seen where two of the uh, two of the Patriot systems are taken out with with a uh, Iskander missile. Um, so it is uh, the, the hypersonic one came in, and I mean, what a, it was an incredible fireball uh, that uh, that erupted out of that. So uh, you know, remember when our uh, when the the Air Force. Uh, uh, um, enlisted person, a guy that uh, leaked all the information uh, on his social media account last right, February. Right, right, right. The kid from uh, Cape May uh, or yeah. Cape Cod, Massachusetts. He just pleaded yeah. guilty last week. Right. Right. So you remember in, in the documents that he released there, they were already concerned. West was already concerned that the air defense systems in uh, Ukraine were failing. Well, since then, there's been steady attrition by the Russians, but it's it's now accelerated this week. They're blowing up Abrams, they're blowing up HIMARS, they're blowing up uh, Patriot missile batteries. And if, it, it would be one thing if the United States had factories up and running that were cranking that stuff out, you know, popping out a Patriot missile battery every every week, but that's not happening. And the, then apart from the launcher that they that, that is provided, you actually have to come up with the the missiles that you feed into it, the the rockets that are fired from it. They're, they're not producing those at any any significant pace either. So that that's why I'm saying that it doesn't matter how much money is magically appropriated or not appropriated, because it's not going to start producing uh, equipment and material that the Ukrainians could use. And when I say could use that presupposes you got somebody trained to use it that's when when those missile batteries are being destroyed it's killing the trained personnel and and i strongly suspect that the those were nato uh, P, uh forces troops uh connected with nato countries that were killed uh two days ago or any of the killed americans is, is, is it not likely <clears throat> that whether they're military out of uniform or intelligence or contractors, whatever you want to call them, human beings that are Americans killed in Ukraine by Russian military. Oh, it's highly likely. Yes. I mean, apart from the, uh, the, the mercenaries that are there, uh, I think it's pretty clear that there are, uh, as is described as sheep dipped soldiers, soldiers that have, uh, uh, allegedly resigned their, their r relationship with the military and gone off to do this, but uh, they're there in, in, a, in an unofficial official capacity. What is sheep dipped? <laughs> well, the, to be sheep dipped, it was actually a, a, an expression that goes back to the intelligence community. But but you just you you you're 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 disguising their true. Uh, responsibility or true relationship with the government. You're trying to create uh, 
if you will, like a Chinese wall. So they can say, and there may be a side agreement where they say, okay, look, you're going to resign uh, on paper, but in reality, you're going to still be part of the military. You're going to still get these benefits. Uh, but as far as the world's concerned, they're going to see you as a private citizen that has decided to fight. Okay. Uh, cut number five, Sonia. This is part of the uh, president's State of the Union on uh, Thursday evening. Larry, listen at the end where he says, quote, there are no American soldiers who are in Ukraine. Yeah. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that needs to defend itself. That is all. That is all Ukraine is asking. They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers at war in Ukraine, and I'm determined to keep it that way. Not true, right? Yeah, it's not true. Um, as the New York Times article that came out two weeks ago of, with respect to CIA, you know, a lot of those, you've got a fairly close relationship between CIA through their, their, ground, their special activities division, ground branch. They're the ones that handle the paramilitary activities and, right. and, the, and the Pentagon. Uh, the, there has been uh, you know, sort of one of the consequences of the last 20 years of the global war on terror is that you got more of a revolving door going back and forth between uh, U.S. military, especially uh, particularly in the special operations field, and then going into the agency and working on the ground in areas like Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Ukraine. Before we uh, segue over to Israel and Gaza, uh, you mentioned this in one of your uh, posts that I saw uh, while I was uh, in Europe last week. What are glide bombs, Larry? So glide bombs, uh, these are conventional bombs. Uh, you know, they're uh, 500 kilograms, which, you know, that's like a thousand pounds uh, up to 1500 kilograms, which is a monster, you know, over a three, you know, almost a 4,000 pound bomb. Uh, and they've been modified so that you can attack, uh, attach fins to it, essentially wings, that it can be launched from an aircraft. But unlike a conventional iron bomb or even a smart bomb, uh, where the aircraft has to be fairly close to the site that you're trying to hit, uh, th this is, can be launched from a distance. Uh, up to 60, say 60, 70 miles away, and it glides into the target and hits. So it, it means that even if there was a threat from air defense on the ground, this is a way to evade the air defense and still deliver a really uh, powerful uh, explosion on site. And it, it, that's really what uh, has, uh, accelerated the fall of Abdifka because these bombs were hitting Ukrainian positions and entire buildings would disappear. So these things literally blow a hole in the defensive uh, line, the defensive uh, uh, positions of the Ukrainian uh, army. When you say they uh, evade uh, defenses, is that because they're too low? No, no. Well, I said the, 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 the air defense systems are not designed to hit this kind of incoming bomb. Okay, got it. And and the Russians are using this in Ukraine. We we don't. Oh have yeah. It. Well, actually, we have uh, we have a version of it. It's called the JDAM. Uh, but the, what the Russians have done is that they've got this enormous stockpile of these old conventional iron bombs, and they've been able to modify them so that now they're used as glide bombs. So they, uh, it, it really is. It, it has, uh, you know, we've thrown that term around a game changer, but this has been a game changer uh, with respect to uh, Russian offensive operations. What is your uh, view uh, of the uh, overheard conversation uh, <clears throat> among the German generals uh, talking about uh, defying the chancellor and sending uh, Taurus uh, missiles to Ukraine? Uh, it was. Uh, I think this was an intelligence operation by the Russians. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of specula speculation that it always the Chinese, always the Singaporeans. Again, I just, I just look at the timing of when that information was released. It came literally within 24 hours after Vladimir Putin had issued his warnings to the West about their meddling and support uh, and facilitation 
uh, of the killing of Russian uh, civilians. So uh, when and then that came out as further proof, but basically it it put the exclamation point on what Putin had said the previous day. Now it, it, it's really fun to watch because this has created uh, a, a real a battle between uh, Germany and England and uh, you know exchange of war of words with France uh, and and it's in turn it created some real internal problems for Olaf Scholz. So he's. He's now become even more reluctant to intervene and allow German troops and German equipment to be used in Ukraine. So this is this is an it really from an intelligence operation. This has helped stir the disarray within NATO. Um, Alistair Crook, who agrees with your analysis, uh, actually went a step further and described it as panic. Uh, amongst <laughs> yeah. uh, the heads of state uh, in Western Europe, they they don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a, that's clear. And is Macron an outlier, or, or does he just want to sound tough? I mean, three times in the past ten days, he's talked about sending troops. Yeah, he, he uh, you could say that he's lost his mind. I mean, that it is it, it's irrational what he's doing. Uh, because I could understand it if it was going to uh, engender political support among um, the French population, but it's not. It's doing just the opposite. And in, in fact, he he has become the unity candidate in France because he's united united both the opposition and some members who used to support him, and they're they're all going. Uh, in, you know, there's growing opposition to to what he's saying. And the, the the French military as well is saying, oh, wait a second. No, 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 no. We haven't, we haven't signed up for that. So uh, it's really, uh, it's odd behavior. And it's just, you know, it's further confirming what Putin has been saying all along, that this is, that the West is, this isn't about Ukraine. This is about NATO wanting to attack Russia. And that these kinds of comments by Macron uh, simply highlight that. Well, NATO is attacking uh, Russia, and and we know that. I wonder how many countries' uh, troops are involved, whether they're actually pulling triggers or just involved in technical advice, which may be a euphemism for pulling triggers, since <clears> some, <throat> as you know, triggers are pulled by pressing a computer key. How many countries uh, actually have uh, people there? Probably the Poles, certainly the Americans. Are there French there? Oh, there are yeah, certainly no, there British there. There might be more Brits there than Americans. Well, the, you know, the, there were French that we know for certain there were French there about four weeks ago when that hotel was hit and it killed uh, upwards of 60, maybe more. Uh, you've got Spaniards, you've got Italians, you've got Brits, you've got Dutch, you've got people from Sweden, from Finland, from Poland. No, and, and, but but understand a lot of the people that are showing up are 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 neo Nazis. They they share these uh, the 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 national socialist beliefs and uh, ideology, and and they're coming from as far away as Colombia and Brazil as well. Mm. But but the point is they are you know the they're not in sufficient numbers. Or uh, capability to actually change the situation on the on the battlefield. They're just they're simply more cannon fodder. So it's inter, inter call it international cannon fodder. Let's um, uh, switch gears or let's transition to Israel and Gaza. How disastrous was it for the administration uh, to invite uh, Benny Gantz uh, to come here over the vociferous objections of the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu? What did they think? Um, General Gantz would say, and were they truly surprised when he basically said the same thing Netanyahu would say, but just in a little bit more of a pleasant way? Yeah, I think they were hoping that uh, doing this would bring greater pressure on Netanyahu to get out of his, you know, to resign, uh, to, to leave, uh, cease being prime minister. Uh, but uh, you, you correctly note, if, even if you put Gantz in, it's not going to change the Israeli policy. There, that they are hell bent on destroying the Palestinian people, uh, push eliminating them from Gaza and taking control of Gaza. So this this was really sort of a ham handed meddling by uh, the Biden administration and trying to interfere in Israel's domestic political affairs, uh, because I think they realized that 
even if they put Gantz in, it's it's not going to lead to a change in policy. It'll just mean that you have somebody who's uh, perhaps more reasonable to talk to. But you can talk to them, but that's not going to change the policy. That's what I think uh, is critical for Americans and, uh, and people around the world to understand. What is Joe Biden talking about? <clears throat> Now, Larry, you'd be a superstar psychiatrist if you could answer whatever follows. What's Joe Biden talking about? What do you think he's talking about when he says red line? We're going to run a clip in a minute where he says there is a red line, there isn't a red line. What is a red line? And what do you think he's talking about when he's when he uses that phrase? Well, usually the, the concept of a red line when a president uses it is that uh, if if you take a particular course of action, then we're going to have no other a response than to do something militarily, that we will respond, we will get into the fight, we will use combat forces. That's what a red line means. So um, listen to this. This is him on MSNBC over the weekend. Um, listen to him say, it is a red line, but there's no red line. Cut number six, Sonia. What is your red line with Prime Minister Netanyahu? Do you have a, a, a red line? For instance, would invasion of Rafa, which you have urged him not to do, would that be a red line? It is a red line, but I'm never going to leave Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical. So there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. So I guess he's trying to have it both ways. I'm never yeah. going to leave Israel, but I wish they wouldn't kill another 30,000 Palestinians. There is a red line, but we're not going to do anything about it. There is no red line. It's that tough was, to figure out what he's talking about. But what is the U.S. going to do if he invades Rafa? Nothing. We'll still right. send him spare parts and all the bombs and killing machinery he wants. So we first heard about the red line with uh, respect to Syria. Barack Obama said, if those Syrians use chemical weapons, that's a red line, and we will retaliate. We will insert mi uh, military troops. So lo and behold, there was a, quote, fake chemical attack. It was ginned up, actually, by British and American intelligence uh, in, in order to try to get the United States militarily involved. Well, then he didn't cross that red line. He backed away. In this case, Joe Biden's got an imaginary red line. He might as well have an imaginary friend because he's saying the red line would be this. If you invade Rafa, we're going to cut off your military and financial aid, period. That would be the red, that would be what uh, red line. You, there's always a consequence attached. In this case, there's no consequence attached to what the Israelis do to the Palestinians. So what, they, so what they kill another 30,000? What are we going to do about it? Nothing. How does the uh, slaughter of the Palestinians end? What what restrains what short of total uh, ethnic cleansing and turning Gaza into a, a beach for mansions? Short of that, how does it end? Well, it's uh, it's going to create a new generation of people who are going to continue to attack Israel. Uh, it, will, it won't be just from among the people that are the victims suffering this right now. They got friends and relatives around the world. This is going to make Israelis and, and potentially Americans less safe traveling uh, and less, say, you know, more vulnerable because th there will be there will be revenge killings. There, there will be uh, efforts to try to seek justice for those who have been murdered. Uh, so uh, I think. The way this is going to ultimately play out is Israel's going to overstep, go into Lebanon, and they're going to face a military defeat there. That will stop the killing in Gaza, and it's going to force Israel to figure out what it needs to do to save itself at that point, because uh, you know they have grossly miscalculated their ability to handle Hezbollah, and I, I think in. In, in sort of an ironic fashion, Hezbollah will become the savior of uh, the Palestinian people. It, w will there be pressure on uh, Joe Biden to send troops uh, or in some form more aid than we've already sent to help the Israelis invade uh, Lebanon? Oh, I'm sure there will be there will be some pressure in some sectors, but uh, 
the American people by and large are not going to endorse or support such a thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and, and it's especially in, in this in this election year, the calculation is all about trying to minimize the risk of the United States suffering a loss or a big black eye. And uh, once you're confronted with having to intervene directly militarily uh, in Israel or Lebanon or any of those countries over there, uh, it's just it's going to feed into the meme that Joe Biden is a war president and he's uh, he's not protecting Americans. What what can the United States do short of the type of phone call you mentioned to keep the Israeli military within the confines of its ability to defend Israel under international law? Stated differently, to stop the slaughter. Yeah, no, I don't. Unless we cut, unless we cut off the aid, or unless we start uh, uh, agreeing at the UN Security Council. Yeah, there needs to be a permanent ceasefire. Unless we reverse our position, this is going to continue. This is not going to stop. Uh, Israel is not going to stop. They have, you know, the the images we keep seeing of them, you know, they shot and killed an elderly deaf guy the other day. Uh, you know, he was uh, waving his hands because he couldn't communicate. I mean, he couldn't talk. You know, and they shot him. He was unarmed. and And they were laughing about it later. The soldiers were laughing about it. Mm. Um, so the images of, of the children who's uh, seen their parents shot and murdered, unarmed people all the time being shot. This the bombs uh, going off. I mean, it, it, it's sickening. It's horrifying. But this re reminds me of some of the revelations of um, Julian Assange of American uh, drone operators laughing when their drones uh, killed uh, civilians in uh, in Afghanistan. Yeah, the Israelis didn't learn a they didn't learn a damn thing from Abu Ghraib. You know, you think you think after Abu Ghraib that people would learn, hey, you got social media, you got these uh, uh, camera phones, don't take pictures, don't take videos, don't record it. Not only do they record it, they then post it. It gets posted on social media because they're proud of it. So, the, the, and this is this is taking place on a scale that surpasses anything that the United States did in Iraq. Uh, to civilians, uh, just uh, it's it's on just an entirely new scale. So um, the world, you know, the world sits back and watches in horror, and we're still faced with uh, there's only one country actually doing something, trying to stop it, and that's Yemen with the Houthis. Right. Uh, and Mike Pompeo, we now know why he was dancing with the IDF. He said over the weekend he'd love to go back to being um, Secretary of State under a a second. Uh, uh, Trump presidency and probably the whoever controls the Senate, you know, it's the war party. So it doesn't matter if it's if Chuck Schumer's the leader of the Senate or whoever's going to replace uh, Mitch McConnell, they'll they'll confirm uh, a person with that mentality and that attitude. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt. Uh, but, um, you know, the at, at some point we're going to the United States is going to have a, a cold wake up call. You know, reality is going to intrude. Uh, I, I think that will come first uh, via Ukraine. And, you know, the, the likely scenario is that as Ukraine is starting to collapse, the United States will try to intervene militarily. And in the process, you know, we're going to suffer some grievous losses. And it's when you finally, when you start losing, and when you have people being killed and you're losing, uh, you know, key uh, military equipment, all of a sudden, you wake up and go, well, wait a second, I thought, I thought we had the best military in the world. Uh, instead, it turns out, as you know, we've said many times, we've got the most expensive, not necessarily the best. Um, Ray in McGovern says that uh, Biden's going to be confronted with a choice of troops or nukes because he's got to keep the war going with the illusion of victory coming before election day. Well, we hope it uh, certainly hope it's not the latter. Yeah. Because the United States would wind up on the, uh, you know, we, we would lose that confrontation for this reason. Uh, Russia has developed ballistic missile defense systems. It's not to say that that's a hundred percent. It's not to say that one or two U S nukes would get through and we'd kill 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Russians. But Russia as a country, both by virtue of its vast, vast size and its dispersal of uh, population, uh, would survive such an encounter. The United States would not. And, uh, you know, this... The, the need for cooler heads for some adults to step up and say, look, wait a second. We don't need to be into this life and death struggle with the Russians or for that matter, the Chinese. We need to find out a way that we can actually live together, work together on common issues of common interest without killing each other. But you, you, if you step back and objectively look at the behavior of the United States, you know, most of my adult life, going back to, it's been war, 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 war. And, and we, you know, we celebrate going, everything from small, like going into Grenada or invading Panama or bigger, you know, Iraq twice, Syria, Afghanistan, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia. Uh, you know, the Serbia, you know, the list goes on. And, and at some point, Americans need to step back and say, wait a second, what is it that we're about? We're not spreading democracy. We're spreading death and destruction. Right. And, and we need we need to reevaluate what what does it mean to be America in the modern world? How could how can we be constructive? If nothing else, let's fix our own problems at home. Let's, let's secure our borders. Let's make our cities safe. Let's make sure children are educated. Let's see if the drug use can go down instead of killing over a hundred thousand a year and climbing. But instead, we're you know we're like this uh, you know extremely obese, uh, chain smoking, uh, drinks two bottles of scotch a day, worrying about telling everybody else that they need to get healthy, that they need to exercise. And we refuse to take care of our own selves. These are um, horrible images uh, you're painting, but uh, it's a message that needs to get out there, Larry. Very articulate. Thank you very much, my friend. So uh, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you at the end of the week with that youngster, Ray McGovern. Yep, folks missed you on Friday. I was getting all sorts of messages. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm deeply flattered. I'm getting a, a lot of welcome back, welcome back. Even one said. Who do you think you are? How dare you yeah. leave us like that? <laughs> uh, but you know, we had a we had a very busy day last Monday, and the numbers were enormous from just that one day. So it's deeply gratifying. But back to work with all, all of right. our uh, regulars on this week. Thank you, Larry. We'll see you Friday. All righty. Bye bye. Okay. Uh, Kyle Ann's alone uh, at two o'clock this afternoon Eastern. And as I just said, all of your regulars uh, throughout the week: Scott uh, Ritter, Colonel uh, McGregor. Professor Sachs, Professor Mearsheimer, Max Blumenthal, Aaron Matei, Colonel Kwiatkowski, uh, Matt Ho, and uh, as much as we can bring you, Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom.